what happens in life, um, our response should be to trust in the Lord. Because uh, things are going to not go our way. Uh, that's going to be often in life that you wish things were different. You want things to be different. Whether it's about you, somebody else, your kids, or whatever. Um, and the response that we have to get to the point where we say, I will trust in you. Otherwise, you're going to be beating your head up against a wall. And you're going to be mad and angry and bitter um, your whole life until you just say, I can trust in the Lord. If you got your Bible, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians this morning. And we've gone through all the books of the Bible. And we're all the way to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is a classic book that teaches a lot of important lessons. We started on it on Wednesday night. And so we're going to, um, this morning, talk about the book of Ephesians again. But here's the simple goal today. If I can get you to believe this, then, let's, then we'll be successful today. This is what I want you to understand. The book of Ephesians teaches us this. That um, it is possible for a Christian, regardless of their past or regardless of how they're living right now, it is possible for a Christian to live a very godly life in a very wicked world. It is possible Okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what path you've been down, how you spent last year, how you spent last decade. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't even matter how you're living right now. If you are a Christian and the Spirit of God lives inside of you, it is possible for you to live a very godly life in a very ungodly world. And the verse that we would uh, quote a lot of times to make people think this would be Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What that means is regardless of where you find yourself, what the situation, what the circumstances are, what's going on around you, regardless, we have the ability to survive and thrive in an ungodly world. Okay? You don't have to continue to live in sin. You don't have to continue to act like you've always acted. If the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you have the power, the potential, the ability to live a godly life in an evil world. The verse we're going to look at is Ephesians 3, verse 20. Okay? This is the verse that we're going to begin by talking about this. And this is very encouraging. Um, we're going to read Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Y'all, if you're able to stand up, you can stand up while I read these two verses. Um, get your blood flowing a little bit. Um, we'll read verses 20 and 21 together. Paul says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right, y'all can be seated. You think about what this is saying. Paul says, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. What that's saying is God can do, um, he, he is so much more capable of doing things Beyond your wildest imagination, okay? Uh, we, we would put limitations on what God can do, really. I mean, we might think that God can uh, help me in some situations, that I can overcome some situations. If I've got a headache, maybe that'll go away. But some other situations, uh, we would not think that God can intervene. But this is not actually talking about what God can do apart from us. What it says is, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. What he's trying to communicate here is there is a power inside of you. God is going to do a work in and through you that is beyond your wildest imagination. If the Spirit of God dwells inside of you, and the Bible says in Romans 8, 11, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us and will give life to our mortal bodies. What that means is the same power that raised Christ from the dead gives us the ability to live a new life on planet Earth. And you know what? Your new life, this is, a, this is, a, this is exactly what he's trying to say, can be exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. It, it's unbelievable. So this is what he's trying to say, that you and I have no idea what God is able to do in and through us. That there is potential in us. There is potential in us. That is greater than you would ever dream. Okay? Now, I don't know if you believe that or not. If you believe that, hey, there is potential inside of you. Potential inside of you to do what? To do all things through Christ. 
constantly gives me strength. Whatever challenge I face, whatever difficulty I face, I, with, with the, the, the power that dwells inside of me, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, gives me the ability to be the person that the Bible talks about that. And you know what? This is, this is kind of corny, but it made me think of superheroes. Superheroes who have supernatural power, supernatural abilities. Um, I showed y'all a YouTube video. I don't even remember when this was. It's been a while back now. Some of y'all might remember this. Of Popeye the Sailor Man. I'm glad you remember that. Uh, Spinach. There you go, Hudson. So they pay attention more than you think they do. Um, you show a video, they'll watch it. But Popeye. If you know about Popeye the Sailor Man, this is back to when I was growing up. Back in the... Sydney and Ellie think that was back in the 60s. It wasn't in the 60s. It was the 90s. Okay. Popeye was this very puny, weak, just pathetic little guy. His arms were that big around. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about here? He was a string bean. Anybody could whoop Popeye. But if Popeye got a hold of that spinach, when he got that spinach inside of him, he'd get that can of spinach and get it popped open and eat that spinach, he, all, all of a sudden, and it totally changed everything. And this guy who was puny and weak and could do absolutely nothing could whoop anybody's tail, right? He had this supernatural strength inside of him that gave him abilities to do what he couldn't do on his own. I thought about Superman. If you know the, the, the old Superman, Clark Kent, this average, normal, ordinary guy. Nothing special about him, but you let him get in a phone booth, you let him put his cape on, now he can jump over tall buildings, he can fly. He's Superman. You say, what does that have to do with the Christian life? Well, it has a lot to do with it, really. It, put it in our language, just the way we would understand this, and this is what everybody needs to understand. When a person is born again, and the Spirit of God lives inside of us, we gain the supernatural ability to live a godly life in a very ungodly world. It, that, that's what it requires of us. And, and with, with, with the Lord, with the Spirit of God inside of us, we can do that. Um, a, a great little verse, a couple of verses here that make the point. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children. And you have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. What's the point he's trying to make? Look, we can talk about how difficult it is that we find the world, the flesh, and the devil, and all that's very challenging. And you can talk about your circumstances, and about these people you have to put up with, and about these temptations you struggle with. And we can just hop this up to we feel like, man, there's no way. What the Bible would say is, greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. It's not that being healthy is that good, but it's a supernatural, divine ability that's given to somebody when they're born again that gives them the ability to be exceedingly abundant above all you can ask or imagine. Another passage I like is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What that means is the divine power. It's not, that means the power that comes from God. It's not that I'm so smart or I've, I've learned so much through life. There is a divine power that gives you all things that you need for life and for godliness. In other words, if you are a believer, if you are a born-again Christian, you have all the tools and all the equipment that you need to live a godly life. There is no excuse not to do it. And here's the question, and I'm going to try to just make this simple this morning. What can we do as Christians? What, and I, I believe this, I believe this. What supernatural powers do we have? So I don't, I don't feel like I have any supernatural powers. If you're a Christian, you have supernatural power that lives inside of you. To do what? To, what, what, what does it give you the power to do? Popeye became very physically strong. Superman could fly and all this stuff. What can we do that we can't do on our own? Well, I want this is very simple. When you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you have the power to change for the better. To change. All right. And I'm going to read some verses out of Ephesians four, verse seven, starting at verse seventeen. Listen to these verses. Listen to this. This is what you can do. This is amazing. This is incredible. This is not something that happens very often. But this is what the Bible talks about. Listen to this. This I say, and this, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, 
that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness toward all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You know what I'm saying out there? This, this, is my, this is my summary, my translation. What you do as a Christian, you take off the old man. The old man, you put him off, you take that off, and you no longer walk. You do not walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Okay? You don't continue to live like you used to live. You don't continue to walk like everybody else walks. You don't stay on that same old path doing those same old things. He says, you put on the new man. You be renewed in your mind. He even says, if you put on the new man, which was created in true righteousness and holiness. You know what? This is amazing. This is a miracle. This is what it is, a miracle. This person becomes truly righteous and holy. You know what that means? There's no pretend here. I used to do this. I used to act like this. I used to say this. I used to participate in all this. But you know what? Because the Spirit of God lives inside of me, I'm able to take off the old man and put on the new man. And now this person, they are different. They have been changed. They are truly righteous and holy. And what I would say to anybody here is, what, this, what the big point is, you don't have to continue being what you've always been. You don't have to live like you've always lived. With, with the Spirit of God inside of you, which you must have, you can change. You don't have to go keep repeating the same. See, most people, most people, this is just the truth, they live the same way for years and years and years. Same sins for years and years and years. I'll tell you a little story to illustrate this. Friday night, um, my wife comes up with this idea. We're going to go to the corn maze. Right? And we're going to go with Courtney and with Ryan and Melissa. We're all going to go have fun at the corn maze over in South Carolina. So that's good. I like going to corn mazes. I've probably been to about 25 of them in my life. Okay? Uh, it's an annual thing ever since I was a youth pastor. That kid's the corn maze. So we got the corn maze. I'll try to make this long story short. There were 18 people. Um, I think there were 11 kids, 7 adults, whatever. Anyway, we get the corn maze. You know what corn maze is? It's like five acres. They cut this maze in there, and you go through it and try to get it all the way out the other side. I get, we get in there, and this is just to make a long story short. Um, Ace runs off with Bentley, and it's dark. Okay. And I said, honey, it's not good for Ace to be in there with the older kids. We don't know where he is. I'm going to go find Ace. Alright. I'm being the adult here. I'm being responsible. I'm going to go in there and find Ace. Lee's already back. He knows where he's going. Y'all stay together. I'm going to find Ace. <laughs> this is really what happened. So I set off. I leave the group. They're reading these clues. You can read clues and try to figure out the way. You can do the hints. You get the map out. You know, I thought, I'll just use my intuition. And I really thought, I'll just follow the moon. The moon will be my guide. The full moon, if I, if I use the moon. Anyway, I'll try to make a long story short. Following the moon was not the right path. This, I am not lying. I spent, I know, 25 minutes out in the corn maze. And I thought, you know, I thought, I thought, I'm going to get out here. I'm going to scare these kids. You know, I'm going to sneak around. And all a lot I had was my phones. I was going to jump out. Well, I never saw the kids. I never could find the kids. I saw one guy in 25 minutes. I was going to one fella in 25 minutes. I started seeing the same things over and over and over. And I'll tell you what I saw. I, I, I promise this is true. A little sign right there. And first, it said no foul language. First time I kind of smiled, you know, well, no foul language out here where the kids are playing in the corn maze. Why do you say no foul language? About the twelfth time I saw it, I understood why they put no foul language on it, right? Uh, it was making me want to say some foul language. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm in decent shape. I'm in decent shape. I run 20 minutes a day, like uh, four or five times a week. I've got a huge blister on the bottom of my foot from walking around in that corn maze. For almost, I, I walked, I ran, I, I did it. I tell you, this is how bad I could find my way out. I could not. 
I really couldn't. I was not at first. I was just going to scare. I could not find my way out of the thing. Uh, I, I really thought all I had was phone. I was going to start taking notes on my phone about, you know, at the sign, I saw the sign said Arrowhead like 10 times. At Arrowhead, I took a left. So I could get the process of elimination together. I couldn't find my way out. Finally, I got back to the entrance. I just backtracked, and I never even got through the thing. Jennifer texted me, you know, and, and said something. I said, I ain't seen nobody in 25 minutes. I got there's nobody there. And I thought, well, I'll wait on them and see if anybody else gets out. You know, I thought, well, I, I got out. They're probably still in there. Well, here they come. I'm, I'm not lying. I said, they're about 10 seconds. And here comes the hayride. <laughs> and all 17 people were on the hayride. They done rode the hayride around the whole property while I've been in the corn veins going around in circles. <laughs> and then Ben gets off and says, uh, Daddy, you know, let me show you how to do it. And he wants me to follow him through there, and in three minutes and 30 seconds, we're not going to do it. So, what, what's the point of the corn maze story? The point is, I was in there just going around in circles. I, I was stuck. I mean, literally. I couldn't get out of the predicament. The, I was on my own. And you know what I thought? And this is really true. For a lot of people, their life looks like that. Right? It is the same old things over and over and over. It's sin, and it's sin, and it's sin, and it's fussing, and it's fighting, and it's ungodly behavior. And you know what? This is the honest truth. This is the honest truth. It don't matter if they want to stop doing it or not. They can't. They cannot find the way out. They are stuck. And I wouldn't want to tell anybody this. There is hope. There is a path out of a sinful lifestyle. There is a path that leads to a new path. You don't have to continue to walk down the same course that the world is on. You can take off the old man and put on the new man and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and live in true righteousness and holiness. That's what Christianity is about. It's not just about, hey, you can go to heaven when you die. We have emphasized that so much that Jesus died for you so you can be forgiven. That is absolutely true. Ephesians 1 7 it says, In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins through his blood. I'm thankful that all my sins are paid for by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, but that's not the whole story of the whole Bible. That's not all it's about. What's Paul trying to emphasize here? He's trying to emphasize that God and his spirit, it's in Ephesians 1 also. I didn't take the time to read it. I'm going to tell you right now. Ephesians 1, listen to this. And, and he, look, he prayed to him. He said, I pray that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. See, he says, there's this exceeding great power that dwells, and I pray that you understand this. That it's not just, yeah, you get a ticket to heaven, you get to go to heaven when you die. You get to be forgiven because of what Christ did and because of the Spirit of God living inside of you. You can escape the corruption of this world. And I'm going to take the rest of the time here to do this. Point out some specifics. What specifically could change? What could change in a person's life? And this is what Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is all about. If you read this book, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 talk about what Christ did for us and how because we're His children, that makes us be part of His family. We have forgiveness. We have an inheritance. Um, all these amazing things. But Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, it talks about how we're supposed to live. And the point is this. You can experience this. What the Bible says is not a fairy tale. Right? So I'm going to start. The first thing, and this, this is a big change for a lot of people. This is a change that needs to take place in a lot of people's life. Listen to this. You can become an honest person. Honest. Listen to what he says in chapter 4, verse 25. Listen to this. Listen to this. Therefore, putting away lying, will each one of you speak truth with his neighbor? For we are members of one another. You know what he says? You can put away all those lies. You can just eliminate that out of your life. Stop telling lies. You know what? This is a huge, for a, and that's a huge change. When you, when you lie, when you're deceitful, what, that's a lifestyle. It's, it's a certain way that people live. 
In other words, I'm not honest about what I'm doing with my money. I'm not honest about my relationships. I pretend. I put on a fake face, and I I can really straighten up. And um, y'all know this story. I, this is just in my head right now. I probably need to tell it. I told it about a hundred times. Henry Ford story here. A uh, man worked for a Ford Motor Company. He came in to work one day. He told his boss, he said, uh, look, I've been working here for 15 years. Every Friday, I've been stealing tools. I take a tool out with me every Friday. He dumped the whole bag of tools out of the desk. He said, I'm bringing everyone up back. I got saved and baptized this weekend. And I'm turning every tool back in. man did not know what to do. He went to Mr. Ford. He said, Mr. Ford, uh, I'm this guy's supervisor. He brought all these tools back in here. I don't know how to handle the situation. Mr. Ford looked at him. He looked at the tools. He said, baptize every man in the plant. All right. What's the moral of the story? He realized there's something changing these people. There's a change that's happening. This guy, it needs to happen in a lot of people. Y'all you know, let me teach you an awesome verse. These are my favorite verses in the Bible. Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord will not count against him, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You know what? I don't even believe most people believe. I don't even think most people believe this. You can live a life that is free from deceit. You don't have to have deceit in your life. You don't have to be hiding anything. You don't have to be pretending. You don't have to act a certain way when you're at church or around the pastor and act a different way when you're not. You know what? You can act the exact same way when I'm with my wife or when I'm not with my wife. I can talk the exact same way when she's listening or if she's not around. You know what I thought? And this is, this is a simple illustration, but your life can be identical on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, just like these two pews. These two pews are about identical. This pew and this pew, pretty similar there. You know your life can actually be like that, where, hey, what I look like here is what I look like there. I'm not hiding anything. You say, how, how, do you, how can you be honest? How can you know, put away lying? Through the Spirit of God living inside of you, it gives you the ability. I love the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, if I have cheated anybody or stolen anything, I'm going to pay it back four times, and I'm selling half my possessions to get them to the poor. Zacchaeus had had this, this problem with lying and stealing and deceiving people and taking what was his. He said, I'm giving them back four times what I took, and I'm selling my possessions. It totally changed where that sin had been present. A new life was born, true righteousness and holiness. Not pretend, not sometimes, all the time. It's a major change. I'll read y'all some verses right here. This is out of Ephesians 5. You can turn there. Ephesians 5, verse 8. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is, this is, I mean, this is what it means to be really changed. Ephesians 5, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. You know what? A life, a sinful life is always marked by secrets and darkness. What's darkness represent? Nobody sees, nobody knows, this is just what I do. And I, you know, he says, you can live like you're in the light. And that's what Christianity is about, to come out of the darkness and into the light. You say, I don't think I can ever do that. Well, I'll tell you this. You can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you would ask or imagine according to this power that works inside of you. You do not have to live that way. So the first thing is you can be honest. You know what else you can do? Um, you can forgive people. Ephesians talks a lot about this. I'm not going to say a lot about it, but uh, Ephesians 4.26. Listen, this is what the book is about. Listen to this. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Then in verse 31 he says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. See, what he's saying is, um, to be, this is just what you're looking for, to be kind, compassionate, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Don't be filled with anger and wrath and malice. He says, look, do not let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, you, you, don't, you can do it. Walk through life mad and angry. Paul says an angry man abounds in tragedy.
transgressions, when you get mad, the sins are going to start just flowing, okay? But you say, well, I, I can't forgive that person. Well, I, I understand that, and some things are hard to forgive, but the reality is you can do it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We don't, we can, uh, you know what, I, I thought of it this week, and I don't think this is an exaggeration, and I'm not here to brag. Me and Jennifer have been married, I added it up this week, uh, a little under 5,000 days. Okay? That doesn't sound like that much, I say it like that, but. Seems like it's been <laughs> uh, no. But I say, round up to 5,000 days, 5,000 nights, I would bet you a $100 bill that I have said to her, I'm sorry, at least a thousand times. You say, well, why, why would you be doing that? Because I've messed up at least a thousand times. Once a week, you get that much to mess up. But you know what the Christian life is all about? It's not about me being perfect. And it's not about our marriage being perfect. You know what it's about? Being forgiving. Being compassionate. Not letting the sun go down on your anger. I don't know who you're mad at. It might be your spouse. It might be your ex-spouse. It might be your brother. It might be your sister. It might be your pastor. It might be your ex-pastor. It might be your sister-in-law. I don't know. I don't know. And you say, oh, I, I, I'm just never going to talk to them again. Well, you can do that if you want to. Or if the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you have the power and the ability. You know what? I, that doesn't mean that I love to say I'm sorry. I don't love to say I'm sorry. Being out of this flesh will say, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. That's the reality of it. I'm right, you're wrong. You need to you know, wise up a little bit. I can't believe that you're acting like that. But you know what the right thing to do, what the Christian thing is to do, what we can do. The only reason I share you that story is that you can do that. Say, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. Let's work it out. That's what the Christian life is all about. Forgiving somebody. So you be honest. You forgive other people. What else is it about? Look, live a pure life. Uh, listen to what he says. Chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, to be pure and holy. Um, listen to what he says. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor coarse, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. See, he says fornication, that's sexual uh, activity prior to marriage. Uncleanness. Um, covetousness. Don't even let that be named among you. That's not fitting for people who are saints, people who are holy ones. If you're going to be holy, you cannot be participating in ungodly behavior. Um, and, you know, I, I believe this, and I don't know a, a way to say this without just sounding kind of blunt about it. We live in a culture that's almost decided that, that sexual purity or high standards are not even possible. It's not even practical anymore. So just don't get pregnant before. You know, as long as you don't get pregnant, as long as you uh, um, uh, don't actually go all the way, then that's okay. You know, just keep uh, maybe a little bit of your clothes on, try to, you know. And, uh, we, we don't even really act like it's possible to live a truly godly and righteous life. But it is. It's, and you say, well, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult. But greater is this in you than is in the world. What are you going to tell my kids? What would you tell your grandkids? You can live a godly life. I say this. Y'all probably done this story before. It's, it's probably the most proud, the proudest accomplishment of my life, of my entire life. When me and Jennifer were dating, when I became a legitimate follower of Jesus, for three years prior to us getting married, we did not even kiss. You say, what? What? That little thing where the preacher says you can kiss your bride. Um, you say, well, why don't you tell us that? Why aren't you proud of that? Because it shows. With the Lord's help, so I tell anybody this, there's no excuse for you to be engaged in sexual sin. For you, you say, well, I can't help it. You can help it. Yes, well, we know we love to say, we love to say this. Do it the best I can. Do it the best I can. If you're living in sin and you're a Christian, you're not doing the best you can. Amen or amen? You're not doing the best you can. You can do exceedingly abundantly above. Y'all want to share your story? Hey, this is a cool little story. I'm about to be done. 
Everybody knows that King David committed adultery. King David got himself just in a mess. But at the end of King David's life, now this is a pretty cool story. He was having trouble staying warm. Okay? Some of y'all have seen older people come in my dad's door and run over the heater trying to get their feet warm. Okay? They couldn't stay warm. But listen to this. Now King David was old, advanced in years, and they could not, and they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord the king, and let her stand before the king, and let her take care of him, and let her lie in your bosom, that our Lord the king may be warm. So they sought a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel, and found Abishag, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very lovely, and she cared for the king, and served him. But the king did not know her. <clears throat> Listen to this. This was thought he was hired to lay in the bed with him and keep it warm. And I found a lovely young woman. <clears throat> and David in the past had this problem with women. But you know what I like? David didn't sleep with her. You know what that tells me? You can change. You don't have to be what you've always been. I don't know what that means for you. I don't know what sin, what lifestyle. What else does Ephesians talk about? Ephesians talks about, uh, this is where the verse comes from, Ephesians 4.30. Let no, um, it's the verse, I'll, I'll read it to you. I can't remember how, exactly how it reads. Listen, um, verse, four, verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What is good and necessary for education? that may impart grace to the hearers. You know what that comes from? If you don't have something good to say, don't say it. Um, see, you say, well, your tongue, your tongue, that's something people struggle with. They have critical tongues. They have bitterness. They have hateful tongues. But you can have new speech. Uh, Ephesians 5, you know what Ephesians 5 is all about? Who knows what Ephesians 5 is all about? It's famous because it says, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Bond servants, obey your masters. Masters, treat your servants. See, you only say it, and this, this is so true. You, at home, in your marriage, raising your kids, where you work, those are some of the toughest relationships that you're going to have. People will say, I cannot stand my boss. My wife is driving me crazy. I can't help it with these kids running around. They're driving me up the wall. I'm losing my mind. And you know what we do? We just basically think, I'm doing the best I can. But you know what? You know what? Anytime I do marriage counseling, first thing I'm going to tell anybody is this. Marriage can be awesome. It can be awesome. You're... Your home life can be awesome. Your attitude at work can be awesome. You can be the best employee. You can be the best. You know why? You know why? Because it all goes back to this. That God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask with any court of His power that works in us. Your attitude, your outlook, your actions, your words, it all comes back to... With the Spirit of God living inside of me, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and holiness. That is an attainable goal. Too many times we settle for saying, well, I can't help it. It's their fault. This is the best I can do. In reality, it's not. I'm close by just pointing this out. <coughs> Ephesians 5, verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. To be an imitator of God. Actually, chapter 4, verse 1 says, I beseech you, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. See, you're called to be a Christian. You're called to live like Christ. You're called to be an imitator of God. To actually be godly. To be godly. To be Christ-like. You say, well, that, that, that ain't going to happen. That is not going to happen. <coughs> I would just want you to know this. It's possible. You don't be perfect. But you don't have to stay on the same on the same course. You don't have to go around and around in circles, right? 
You might say, well, I, 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 you're doing it on your own. You've got to find help. You've got to walk with the Lord. You've got to draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. You submit yourself to God. You resist the devil. It's not an easy path, but it is possible. It's possible. I'll tell you this little story because I think it illustrates this pretty well. Uh, Bentley and Hudson used to watch this little movie called Thunderstruck. And it was a pretty neat little movie. I watched it a lot. I mean, they've watched it about 27 times, bro. I've probably watched it about 12. <laughs> it's all in a lot in our house. But in the movie, is this basketball player named Kevin Durant. He's a real good basketball player. This kid that's in uh, middle school is not a good basketball player. And it's a silly little story. But he goes to this basketball game, and he touches Kevin Durant. And when he touches Kevin Durant, he becomes like Kevin Durant on the basketball court. Kevin Durant becomes like him. So he gets these supernatural powers. And this kid goes to be the best player in the country. And everybody's coming to watch him. And Kevin Durant cannot make a shot. And it's a silly little story. But Ke this kid, say his name's Kevin on the show, he begins to act like Kevin Durant. You know what? So what was I doing in it? Well, you'll tell you what. This is what Christianity is about. You and I begin to act like Jesus. That's a big change. That is like an out-of-this-world change. You know what it takes? A miracle. It's a miracle. Christianity is about miracles. It's a miracle in my life. It's a miracle in your life. But it is about God doing a work in us that other people cannot explain, that cannot be imitated by the world. It's not just, well, I'm going to try to change. I'm going to try to do a little better. It's about God does this work in me. The Bible says, be man's in Christ. He's a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. He's been changed. He's been raised to walk in newness of life. And I, I would just, I would encourage you. There's too many times we have, we, we do not even really believe that's possible. You know that little story out there, the little engine could? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. That's actually the story that first started in Sunday school. Why would that be a Sunday school story? 1906 is the first time it appeared in a Sunday school lesson. Why is that a Sunday school lesson? What does that have to do with Sunday school? Because you know what the Bible tries to let everybody know? You can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You can do, you can climb that hill. It don't mean it's easy, but if you put your mind to it and you apply yourself and you put your nose in this book and you walk with the Lord and you walk with the people of God and you and you you fight against sin, you can. Whatever the struggle is, you can win. You can. And too many times it's just it's sad. It's sad to look and say, you know what? We're not living up to our potential. So this morning, here's two questions. Number one, it would be, are you saved? See, uh, Jesus would say it like this, apart from me, you can do nothing. See, apart from the Lord, it's unbelievable how long you'll go down in circles. Unbelievable. You'll, you'll never get out of it. Jesus said, whoever sins is a slave to sin. You're a slave to it. Only through the power of God indwelling you do you even have a chance? And what it means to be saved is you reach a point where you say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. God, forgive me. You understand that Jesus died for you. You call upon the name of the Lord. You put your faith in Jesus to save you. And then if you are a Christian, you have to look at your life and say, you know what? I could probably do a whole lot better. And it doesn't matter what you're talking about. See, Christianity affects all areas of your life. See, you might be doing good in some areas, but you know what? I really ain't treating my spouse like I ought to. I really ain't, ain't loving my kids like I ought to. I really ain't forgiving that person like I ought to. I really ain't being honest with everybody like I ought to be. I really, my tongue really is a little too uh, filled with uh, poison and hate and bitterness. I See, you identify these areas and you say, you know what? I might tell myself I'm doing the best I can, but I'm really not. And this, this morning, see... You, you have to. The Bible says we come to the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. See, Lord, help me. You know, you know what Gentry loves to say? This is what Gentry says all the time. It's one of her favorite phrases. I can't help me. <laughs> Tell her this. I can't help me. I can't help me. You know what? That's, that's not. That's, that's, all right. I can't do this on my own, Lord, help me. Paul says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, I need your help. 
I, I need to change this. I need to work on this. And I'll tell you this. Because of Jesus' death and because the Spirit of God lives inside of us, you can really change. You're not going to be perfect. We all stumble in many things. But you don't have to continue down the same course you've been on in the past. You can live a very godly life. The Bible teaches us that. So we'll have a time of invitation, and it's a chance for you to respond to the Lord. Um, the Bible says, well, I read this one section, well, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. God, I need you to help me. You humble yourself before the Lord, and He can lift you up. He can help you. And so um, I hope the Lord spoke to you through this, through His Word. Um, I encourage you to read the book of Ephesians and see exactly what it means to, to live a new life, to take off that old man, put on the new man, in true righteousness and holiness. But uh, we'll have a time of invitation. You want to put up? Uh, uh, Jesse's going to put up. Uh,